31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36. Today we're going to make a special video and it's it's really it's all about athletics and competition because we know that around the world in many big competitions like the Olympics and the, the World Cup and things like that lots of athletes and sportsmen compete to try and be the best and they compete for prizes and often those prizes are given in the form of either a gold or a silver or bronze medal so what I thought we'd do is just take a look at perhaps the chemistry of gold, silver and bronze and see how they can how sort of line up against one another. 51, 52, 53, 54. So before we really look at the chemistry, all I thought I'd really do is to try and show you a couple of samples so you can see what the metals really look like. So I've got some samples of gold, some silver and some bronze for us to have a look at. Now then you can't tell anybody because this sample of gold is actually my, my other half's wedding ring and um, this is a piece of Welsh gold and you can see it's a really quite shiny, quite beautiful piece of gold. So Welsh gold is really quite historical. It dates right the way back to the Romans when they developed a new technique for mining called hydraulic mining and there's still only one gold mine in Wales producing this gold. It's actually used for the wedding rings of the royal family as well so it's a really quite special piece of gold that I'm going to give to my other half in a few months time. This is a sample of silver and it's unlike much of the silver that we find in the jeweler shops throughout the UK because this piece of silver actually comes from Ethiopia where it was mined directly from the soil and then beaten to the shape of this really quite nice bangle. It's really quite a heavy sample of silver as well. So the third place in any competition normally gets a bronze medal. And this is a bronze medal that we found earlier on in, in our chemistry department, which is normally given to somebody that comes first, and that's first in the graduating class at our university. So if we take it out, we can see that it's a really nice metallic coin, really quite heavy as well. But you know, bronze is different to gold and silver because bronze isn't actually an element. So if we look on the periodic table, we won't find bronze. Bronze is actually an alloy. It's an alloy of copper, and tin. So for the sake of this video we're really going to treat bronze just like we treat copper. So now I'll show you a piece of copper and here it's a rather large lump of copper. It's really quite a soft and malleable material, very expensive as many people find now and it's generally used to make water pipes and all sorts of wires and things like that. So we're going to go and have a look now and see if we can find the, the coinage metals or the noble metals on the periodic table. So what are the differences or the fundamental differences between the coinage metals? Well actually that evolves around the shape and the size of the nucleus. And what can we learn from the periodic table? Well if we look we can see that copper itself has got 29 protons and 35 neutrons. As we go down the group the elements get bigger. Silver has 47 protons and a total of 60 neutrons, so it's quite considerably larger. Now as we go to the bottom of the group we might expect it to get even bigger again and this is right. So we can see from the periodic table that gold has 79 protons and a massive 118 neutrons. So it's really, really large. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go outside and we're going to do a little bit of an experiment that everyone can do so that you can visualise and we can compare the difference between the atomic nature and the, sort of the nucleus of each of these coinage metals. So um, what we're going to do now, right, is we're going to try and build ourselves a nucleus. Now, what does a nucleus look like? Well, nobody really knows because it's like a mixture of neutrons. And what does a neutron look like? Well, nobody really knows because it's a subatomic particle. So today, I just want you to imagine that it's actually something like a chip in. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to make copper in this beaker. So what we need is 29 protons. So here we go, Brady. One, two, three. Bronze is a fantastic thing really because if you think about it there was a whole age from 4,000 years BC when bronze was generated in the Far East in Persia which is now Iran and Iraq. 28, 29. So we have 29 protons. So here we have half of the components of our nucleus. Now we need to add the neutrons. There's 35 of those in copper. One, two, three. Now, bronze is, is an alloy of copper and tin, but if you then add other elements, perhaps like phosphorus, you know, a little bit of perhaps tungsten, maybe a little bit of iron, you can generate a whole range of different materials with different properties. They're all very hard, they're very malleable, really useful to make tools out of, and really that's what spurned on a lot of sort of development of, of our civilizations. 34. 35. So we have 29 protons and 35 neutrons. Copper. So really this is just part of the atomic 
particle itself because we've got all those 29 protons and they're 29 positive charges. So if we want to use our imagination again, we have to imagine 29 electrons all whizzing around somewhere around my head and above and below us, which give us our neutral copper atom. So, now we take a bigger beaker and now we're going to make some silver. It's going to rain. Go on. <laughs> so for silver, we need 47 protons. So at the Olympics, all of the athletes that are competing, they're really striving to be the best and they're striving to take home the gold medal. But you know, gold might not be the best in terms of chemistry. Look, for instance, if we think about conductivity, electrical and thermal conductivity, then silver's the man that you want because it's got the highest conduction that we know of any simple, pure, elemental sample. 46, 47. So there's our 47 protons that are required for a silver nucleus. Now we have to add 60 neutrons. There's 20. 20? You might ask the question, why do we use copper for wires? Well, we use copper for wires simply because it's a lot cheaper. It's more abundant in the Earth's crust. It's easier to extract, much, much, much more useful and much more economical for us to use. So here, 47 protons and 60 neutrons. Let's compare it to copper. I think you can see that it's quite a lot larger. Okay, as we get down the group, we come to our favourite, the one which all of the athletes are trying to aspire to, and that's gold. So here we have a larger beaker so that we can make some gold. So to make gold, we need 79 protons and 118 neutrons. I could be some time. 1, 2, 12, 13, 13, 14, 15, 42, 43, 44. Well, you know, gold's really, really inert. It doesn't form very many um, chemicals or very many compounds. 54, 55, 56. It's a very, very unreactive material, and perhaps it's one of the reasons why many, many of the governments around the world use gold for the storage of wealth. 77, 78, 79. 79 protons to make gold. So now we need 118 neutrons. So we're all familiar with the term bullion and Krugerrand, and it's really interesting because the most pure gold samples that you can get actually come from Canada. They're the Canadian maple, and that's 0.9999% gold, so it's 99.9999% gold. Really, really pure. Many, many of the other bullions that are traded around the world might be 98% gold. So the other bit that's in that sample might be something like copper or nickel or something even as much as silver. Copper very famously is put into gold because it allows us to generate different colours of gold, like rose gold, which is slightly red in coloration. And we might get indium in there, which might give us a nice white gold look, which looks a little bit like platinum. 14, 115, 116, 117, 118 neutrons. So there we have gold. So here, if we bring all three of our metals together, we can see that as we go down the periodic table, so down the group from copper through silver to gold, that the atomic size of each of those particles is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So now that we've done that, it looks like it's going to rain, so we're going to go inside and then I'm going to tell you about my special idea for a new medal. So, so here's my crazy idea. You know, in all competitions, Medals are given out bronze, silver, gold. And if we look at the periodic table, we can see bronze is copper-based, silver, and gold. But you know, in the times when many of these medal conventions were, were established, they really didn't have the bottom of the group, number 111, or Röntgenium. So do you think it'd be really cool like if the, if the winner of the Olympic marathon got a medal of Röntgenium? Well, let's think about it for a moment, because Röntgenium sits here at the bottom of the group and it's extremely radioactive. It emits very, very quickly and degrades, giving out alpha particles very, very quickly. In fact, the most stable isotope of Röntgenium has a half-life of only 10 minutes. Most of those isotopes, perhaps about three to five seconds. So you may think receiving a Röntgenium medal might be fantastic, but you wouldn't have it for very long. And my suspicion is that it's probably not going to be very good for you.